What do the Spanish words lebreria, exito, and delito have in common? Well, they may not mean what you think they mean in English. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. This week, we'll talk about what's wrong with sentences that start with there are. And then, in honor of Cinco de Mayo, I have five fun facts about Spanish. Have you ever heard it's bad to start sentences with there are, there is, and it is? These phrases can be part of what are called expletive sentences. And no, I'm not talking about swearing. The word expletive comes from Latin that means to fill, and in English it's come to mean something that takes up space without adding anything. The swear word meaning goes back to the 1600s and may have been popularized by Sir Walter Scott in the early 1800s, and it was definitely popularized by the Watergate tapes in the 1970s that included the phrase expletive deleted over and over again because Richard Nixon and his aides apparently had potty mouths. But we are talking about the grammatical meaning of expletive, which goes back even further. We had the word first, I tell you. But the two meanings actually have something in common. They both essentially refer to filler words. Those there are's and it is's take up space without adding any meaning to the sentences, and that's why you're generally told to avoid them. Like most writing advice, it's not absolute. Sometimes those phrases help you emphasize something or change the rhythm or focus of a sentence. For example, if Squiggly wanted to take chocolate-making lessons in France but didn't speak French, Aardvark might say, there is a problem with your plan. That puts the word problem right up front in the sentence, compared to, your plan has a problem. Some people say an expletive sentence like that, with the word problem at the beginning, puts more emphasis on the word problem, and I feel like it does. But if you are an astute listener, you will notice that this contradicts the advice Roy Peter Clark gave us about the last word in a sentence being a point of emphasis. Your plan has a problem. It may be that there's a difference between speaking and writing. As a listener, hearing the word problem first makes it jump out at you. But as a reader, seeing the word problem last may make it stick with you more. But I think either way, we can agree that the two sentences sound different, and there are times when you'll want one or the other. But having looked at a lot of student writing when I was a professor, I can definitely tell you that a huge chunk of the time, you'll improve your work by looking for expletive sentences and rewriting them. There are many people who wrote a letter to the editor, can become many people wrote a letter to the editor. There are a few things I need to do today, can become I need to do a few things today. Another problem with expletive sentences is that sometimes it can be tricky to pick the right verb because the subject isn't at the beginning of the sentence where you're used to seeing it most of the time. In English, most of our sentences use the subject-verb-object structure. In many people wrote a letter to the editor, for example, the subject comes first, many people, the verb comes next, wrote, and the object comes last, a letter to the editor. Subject, verb, object. Many people wrote a letter to the editor. But in expletive sentences, the thing that comes first isn't the subject. There isn't the subject in there are many people who wrote a letter to the editor. Even though there is at the beginning of the sentence and it's followed by a verb, the words are just filler. There isn't the subject. Many people is the subject. It's doing the action of the verb, writing. But it's playing hide-and-seek in the middle of the sentence. Now, it might seem straightforward to pick the verb here. You probably wouldn't be tempted to write, there is many people who wrote a letter. But it can get tricky when you have a compound subject made up of singular nouns. For example, I had a question from a listener named Joe a while ago about this sentence. 
there is a couch and a coffee table in the room. Or should that be, there are a couch and a coffee table in the room? Well, you have to identify this subject, which is hiding in the middle of this expletive sentence. It might be tempting to start with, there is a couch, but the entire subject is a couch and a coffee table, and the word and makes it plural, even though the individual elements are singular. So just like we'd say squiggly and aardvark are best friends, using the plural verb are, we say a couch and a coffee table are in the room. Therefore, when we flip it around in an expletive sentence, we still use the plural verb. There are a couch and a coffee table in the room. But even though it's right, that still sounds weird to a lot of people, which is why Joe asked the question in the first place. Some sentences sound bad even when they're right. It's enough to make you use that other kind of expletive. So although this has been an interesting exercise figuring out how to identify the subject, this is exactly the kind of expletive sentence you want to just delete, swoosh, so you can start over and write something better, like the room has a couch and a coffee table. When you're editing your work, look for sentences that start with the words there and it to see whether rewording them would make them better. Often, it does. This next segment is by Susan Herman. Happy Cinco de Mayo! But before you get too excited or end up in a taco-induced coma, do you know the real origins of the celebration? It may surprise you that Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, is not Mexican Independence Day. That is actually September 16th. According to the History Channel, quote, Cinco de Mayo, also known as Battle of Puebla Day, celebrates the Mexican Army's May 5, 1862 victory over France at the Battle of Puebla during the Franco-Mexican War, unquote. In fact, Cinco de Mayo is not widely celebrated in Mexico, except, of course, in the state of Puebla. But it has become a celebration of Mexican culture and food in the U.S., particularly in areas with large populations of Mexican Americans. Let's not totally burst your Cinco de Mayo bubble, though. It's still a great opportunity to appreciate and learn about Mexican culture and the Spanish language. Today, we have five fun facts about Spanish in honor of Cinco de Mayo. One, Spanish is widely spoken in the U.S. and around the world. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 67.8 million people speak a language other than English in the home, and in 62% of those homes, the other language was, you guessed it, Spanish. There are a whopping 41 million Spanish speakers in the U.S., according to the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Since Hispanics are the largest minority population in the U.S., this isn't surprising. In fact, per the Wilson Center, the U.S. has the fourth largest number of Spanish speakers of any country in the world. And when it comes to world languages, Spanish is also up there. Per the language learning website Babbel, there are 450 million native speakers of Spanish in 20 countries plus Puerto Rico. Another 75 million people speak Spanish as a second language. Spanish falls only behind Chinese when it comes to the number of native speakers around the world. English is number three. And for the Cinco de Mayo revelers, Mexico has the largest number of Spanish speakers of any country, but the U.S. is number two. And the Cervantes Institute of Spain predicts that by 2050, the U.S. will take the top spot. Number two, Spanish is relatively easy to learn. No, really, it is. And not just because your high school Spanish teacher said so. According to Berlitz, which used data from the Foreign Service Institute to rank the easiest languages to learn, Spanish is number four. Not bad, right? Spanish is a Romance language, meaning it has its roots in Latin, and a lot of English words also come from Latin so you'll recognize a lot of Spanish words just from knowing English, and more about that in a minute. Also, Spanish uses the same alphabet as English, with a couple of exceptions, and it's a phonetic language, meaning it's pronounced almost always as it's spelled and written. So if you know the alphabet, you can pronounce any word. And this is also why spelling bees aren't a big deal in Spanish-speaking countries, 
spelling just isn't difficult enough to merit competitions. And in general, Spanish follows consistent grammar rules. If you learn the basic structure and the exceptions, you've got it. Not so with English, which is very hard to figure out. You're welcome. Number three, you probably already know more Spanish than you think. Thanks to the many cognates Spanish shares with English, you can likely already understand several spoken and written words. Cognates are words that come from the same root language and look or sound the same, or at least similar. Think of the Spanish inteligente, intelligent, or hospital, hospital. Just beware of false cognates, or false friends, as they're also called. Those are words that appear to be cognates but really aren't. For example, pan in Spanish means bread, not pan. And embarazada means pregnant, not embarrassed. And that could cause a huge embarrassment if misused. Colorín Colorado's website has a great list of Spanish-English cognates. You are already well on your way, mis amigos. Number four, Spanish has a lot of influence from Arabic. The Moors, who ruled the Iberian Peninsula, primarily mainland Spain and Portugal for eight centuries, hailed from northern Africa, practiced Islam, spoke Arabic, and left a significant mark on the Spanish culture and language. According to Arabic Language Online, there are about 4,000 words of Arabic origin in Spanish, around 8% of all Spanish words. One surefire way to recognize a word of Arabic descent is that it begins with A-L, like Alhambra, a beautiful example of Islamic architecture in Granada, Spain, and Alcachofa, artichoke. Some of these words that come from Arabic are also cognates of English, like algebra, algebra, alcohol, alcohol, lemon, limon, and coffee or cafe, café. And number five, the number of Spanish-English bilingual speakers in the U.S. is rapidly increasing. Many languages are spoken in the U.S., 350 to 430, according to Translators Without Borders. In fact, about 25% of people speak a language other than English at home, according to the Census Bureau's ACS. And Spanish is the largest contributor to bilingualism in this country. According to the Pew Research Center, 36% of Hispanics in the U.S. are bilingual, meaning they can use both English and Spanish fluently. The language learning website Lingoda lists several benefits to being bilingual, including sharpening your brain, it can even delay the onset of Alzheimer's, connecting with more people, and increasing career prospects and earning potential, and it can even make you happier. And being that Spanish is so quickly gaining popularity in the business world, it might behoove you to check out some of the many Spanish language learning resources available online through private companies and academic institutions. We hope these five fun facts about Spanish enlightened your Cinco de Mayo celebrations and encouraged you to learn more about the beautiful and diverse Spanish language. Viva Mexico! That segment was written by Susan Herman, a former linguist, analytic editor, and language instructor for the U.S. government. And what did those words I mentioned at the beginning actually mean? Well, libreria is a bookstore, not a library. Exito means success, not exit. And delito is a crime. It doesn't mean to delete anything. Good luck out there. Next, I have a call from our old friend and guest writer, Neil Whitman, who has another addition to our list of terms for not-in-person learning. Hi, Mignon. This is Neil Whitman. Uh, You know me. I've written a few pieces for you over the years. Anyway, uh, I enjoyed listening to your segment on virtual learning or distance learning or remote learning, and uh, I wanted to share with you something that I wrote on my August or wrote on my office whiteboard back in August 2021 as we returned to in-person teaching after a few semesters of COVID-induced teaching from home. And uh, coming back, there were still all kinds of regulations about, you know, when and where to mask up and when to cancel class and what to do if you were exposed or a student was symptomatic or, or whatever else. But uh, what I wrote on my whiteboard is still there. I'm looking at it right now. I uh, I wrote... 
Welcome back. Staying home while the season's returning. Coming back with routines still a-churning. Though we've gained a few skills, we have all at our fill of social distance learning. All right, there you go. Uh, all my best to Squiggly, Aardvark, and the rest of the gang. Hope you're all doing well. Bye. Thanks, Neil. Very clever. And I'll mentally add social distance learning to the mix from now on. And finally, I have a familect story from Sheila. Hi, Mian. This is uh, Sheila from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, our familect is uh, a foreign phrase. Uh, my dad used to, to tell us when we'd ask his kids what was for supper. And his grandmother, so my great grandmother, used to tell him when he was a kid. Uh, it's a Belgian phrase, I'm told, and I probably am murdering pronunciation. And it is e Stefan, no Stefan, Krieg Stefan, which it, I was told is a little bit of this and a little bit of that all mixed together. Uh, brings us memories to me. My dad died when I was 18, which was 40 plus years ago. So I can't ask him how to pronounce it anymore. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sheila. I really wanted to help you find out the correct pronunciation or meaning of what your father was saying, so I asked some of my helpful Dutch-speaking friends on Mastodon. Now, nobody recognized the saying outright, but people did have some ideas. The E sound at the beginning could mean it is, and the part you remember as toughen could be tofa, meaning something like a good one. And I'm going to do my best on these Dutch pronunciations, but they might not be quite right. But so this would give us something like tis tofa das ne tofa, meaning something like it's a good one that's not a good one. Another possibility for the first two parts could be eats herfan, no eats herfan, meaning something like some of this, some more of this. Or the part you remember as toughen could be related to the Dutch word hopfen, meaning to eat or to bite, or the Dutch word stofa, meaning stew. I hope one of these ideas rings a bell for you or another listener who will let us know. I'd love to find the answer, and thanks for the call. If you want to share the story of your family act, a family dialect, or a word your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at 83-321-4-GIRL. Call from a nice, quiet place, and we might play it on the show. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast, and thanks to the team. Our audio engineer is Nathan Sims, our director of podcasts is Adam Cecil, and our marketing associate is Davina Tomlin. Our ad operations specialist is Morgan Christensen, our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchings, and our intern is Cameron Lacey, who is the oldest of four girls. No boys, unfortunately, she says. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. 